as alluded to previously, there are some factors that can make a population act as if it's different than its actual population size. So in, in general, there are some factors that make population act um, as if it's smaller than it really is. So when we're thinking about these, and we're thinking about how quick a population may lose its genetic diversity. And so when thinking about this process, we're going to define something called the effective population size. So the effective population size is the number that is going to allow us to predict how fast a population loses its genetic diversity, not the number of individuals, but some sort of representation of number of individuals. Uh, so there are a number of different things that can cause a population to uh, act as a different number. So first off, the population can fluctuate in size. So this is a population that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And in that case, in order to solve for the effective population size, to find out what population does it kind of act like it's changing um, as, 1 over NE is equal to 1 over T, 1 over N after time T, plus 1 over N after T minus 1, plus all the way back to the very first population size. So this NE is kind of like a this kind of inverted average of all the different um, population sizes here. One of the things that you can prove in a situation like this is that this effective population size is always less than or equal to the mean of those population sizes. And in fact, this effective population size is always less than the mean if any of these populations differ. And after we go through these, we'll actually look at um, kind of a sort of derivation of this result. But for now, the idea is if populations go up and down, the effective population size, the population kind of that it acts like, is less than the mean. And we'll look in more detail um, at this case in just a few minutes. Um, if we have different genders, right, males and females in a population, the effective population size is given by 4 times the number of males times the number of females, all divided by number of males plus number of females. If we have no selfing, so in other words, individuals cannot mate with themselves, which is something that was potential in our panmictic population where we were just thinking about groups of alleles, if we remove selfing, then the effective population size is the actual population size plus one half, so that actually doesn't really make any difference. Um, for normal populations. If the alleles are X-linked, so the effective population size for alleles on the X chromosome. So now we would be thinking about how quickly does genetic diversity get lost from loci on X chromosomes. The effective population size is 9 number of males times the number of females, all divided by 4 times the number of males plus twice the number of females. If it's Y-linked, right, so for loci on the Y chromosome, the effective population size is actually just the number of males divided by 2. And then for mitochondrial DNA, right, that's DNA that's transmitted from mothers to their offspring, but not by males. The effective population size is the number of females divided by 2. And so let's think about a consequence of this. Um, let's think about let's think about comparing X and Y linked loci in a population. So let's imagine a population where we have the number of females is equal to the number of males, and that's going to be equal to one half the total population size. Let's think about for our X linked loci, the effective population size is. 9, right, we're using this equation, times 1 half n, times 1 half n, all over 4, 1 half n, plus 2, 1 half n. If you plug all that in, that's 9 fourths 
n squared over, that's 2n, that's 1n, so that's 3n. So the 3, the 9 and the 3 cancels, you get 3 fourths n for the effective population size of loci on the X chromosome. For that same population, what's the effective population size of the Y chromosome? And E was just the number of males, so that was one half N, right, number of males, divided by two, so that's one fourth N. So now let's think about the ratio of the effective population sizes for the X-linked and the Y-linked loci. Well, the effective population size for the X-linked was three quarters N divided by one quarter N. That's the effective population size for the males. Everything cancels and you end up with three. So what this means is the effective population size for loci on X chromosomes are three times larger than the effective population size for loci on Y chromosomes in a population with equal number of males and females. So that actually predicts more genetic variation for X chromosomes than Y chromosomes. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. When we do um, genetic studies and we look at the genetic diversity chromosomes, we see that X chromosomes have plenty of genetic diversity whereas Y chromosomes have very low levels of genetic diversity. So let's return back to this fluctuating population size equation and see if we can't um, get a better judge about where that equation comes from. And similar derivations to this are used um, to drive some of these other equations. So we're going to think about the pop fluctuating population size. So we're going to start from this point here. Remember we had this equation from um, before. And so from that, we can know this. Right, if we just kind of go back in time one generation, right, if this is true, where this is the next F and that's the previous one, then you could go back one step, but this part here is just going back in um, time one step there. So if this is true, then you can isolate this and you get this. And so if you were to take this and substitute it up into there, what would you get? You get one minus F of T plus one is one minus one over two N of T. Now this part, one minus one over two N T minus one. So by substituting now, if we have two time steps from here to here, we have this term that corresponds to the population size then this term, which corresponds to the next population size to get to this generation. And so continuing this over and over again, you would get more and more of these sorts of terms, right? And our derivation was, although we can get a string of terms like this, we would actually prefer, instead of having to keep track of all these population sizes and generation, what we really want is some sort of value like this where maybe we could take a pair of terms like this and replace them with something like this. If we do a whole string of these, then we would have a whole bunch of these terms. We would have um, you know, 1 minus 1 over 2 n of t times 1 minus 1 over 2 n of t minus 1, all the way down to 1 minus 1 over 2 n of the very first one. And we would want to kind of replace all of these with 
1 minus 1 over 2 n e to however many terms there are. And so this process here is where we got that fluctuating um, population size um, equation from. So all of this should be equal to all of this. So you would end up with um, a term like this, 1 minus 1 over 2 n e raised to the power t equals this whole string of things here. Solve for n e. And then that's where, um, when you do this solving, and we won't write out all the steps, that's where this um, equation came from. So I've kind of just shown a sort of conceptual derivation here. And, and remembering that this. And so the purpose of this conceptual derivation is we can kind of see this equation and memorize it, but this equation, it's just coming from what we had before, just iterated over a large number of steps. Now let's look at an example of using this equation um, to solve a numerical example. Let's look at a kind of simple example. Imagine we had a population that was 1,000 individuals and then 1,000 individuals, and then there was a population crash. It went down to 50, but then it rebounded. It's a healthy population. It went right back up to 1,000 right away. So there's a population crash, but it wasn't long-lived. The population immediately rebounded. So what size would be the most appropriate to consider this population over a long time? Well, the mean population is the 3,050 divided by 4. So on average, there's about 760 individuals. Right? That's the mean population over time. But if we take these numbers and solve for the effective population size, there's four time periods. Um, this is the, the last time period here. Plus, we want the third time period here. Plus the second time period here plus the first time period here. If we kind of plug all those numbers in, uh, we can put all of this over 1,000. If we do that over 1,000, that becomes 20 over 1,000. A 1, a 20, a 1, and a 1, so that's 23. And if you plug those numbers in, and this is 1 over n e, if we flip both these sides, n e is 4 over 1 times 1,000 over 23. When you plug that in, you get about 160. So the effective population size for populations 1,000, 1,000, 15, 1,000 is actually 160, not 760. So this population, just from having one crash like this, acts the same as if it had been a population of only 160 for four generations, instead of what we might have expected, which was to act like a population of 760 for four generations. And this actually illustrates the important, even temporary population crashes, right? This population, as we've depicted it, is healthy. It immediately rebounded back up to 1,000, but the consequences of that one low population generation are much larger than we would have expected it to be. And again, this is one of the reasons why we're concerned with endangered species. Even if we can get their populations back up, a population crash makes them act like they're a much smaller population, um, even in the long term. Now, we can also use information like this to infer population crashes in the past. Right? If you see a population today, and it seems to have you know, 1,000 individuals, 1,000 individuals, um, each year that you go and look, but when you look at its genetic diversity, the diversity is very, very low. That's a really good piece of evidence that at some point in the past, there was a population crash that eliminated a lot of that genetic diversity. And in fact, a kind of well-known example of that is cheetahs in Africa. If you go to Africa, there are plenty of cheetahs, or at least historically, as far as we've been paying attention, there have been plenty of cheetahs. But when you look at the cheetah population in Africa, turns out they're almost all genetically very, very um, similar, 
You can do skin grafts from one cheetah to another, and they accept all of them. They don't have an immunological reaction. At the genetic level, cheetahs are incredibly um, poor in genetic diversity, despite having a perfectly good population size um, until recently when we started killing them. But for the last hundreds or um, maybe a thousand years that we've been paying attention to them, their actual population size was like this. But their total lack of genetic diversity today allows us to infer that something like this happened to cheetahs um, maybe just a few thousands or tens of thousands of years ago, and we're able to understand something about the history of these organisms that we couldn't directly observe um, just by understanding how population size, effective population size, and genetic diversity all work together.